and the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning, and we will begin with topical questions. These will last for up to 15 minutes, and we will then move on to deal with the questions that appear on the oral questions list. I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, given that the University of Ulster has in the past six years dropped from 54 to 88 in the Guardian League table, what strategy have you in place or what works are you doing with the University to help improve their performance? Okay, um, <clears throat> I thank the member for his question. I would stress not to put too much stock in these league tables. There are, are a host of different league tables um, that are used uh, around the world. Um, in which uh, universities are ranked, uh, and that is one of many. There are different uh, weightings that are given uh, in each of these league tables to different aspects of university life. For example, some will place a much heavier reliance upon research, uh, and others more in terms of areas such as uh, student uh, satisfaction. Um, we have, obviously, a, a higher education strategy in place in Northern Ireland, where we are working uh, with the universities across a broad range uh, of issues. Uh, we are investing as an executive heavily in the higher education sector, and we appreciate the importance of that uh, to the economy in, in Northern Ireland. And I'm very proud to say that we have three world-class universities that are present in Northern Ireland that are really making their presence felt and are critical to our future uh, economic potential. Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response, and indeed I do agree with him that we have world-class universities. But in the light of the apparent decline, can you advise why the external review mechanism that would have identified issues of concern at a much earlier stage was removed, having been in existence since the inception of the university? And is it not now time that this was replaced? Well, what I can say to, to the member is that there is an ongoing dialogue between my department uh, whether it's a ministerial level or official level with the universities uh, on an ongoing basis. I mean, and they, those exchanges range from the accounting uh, officer uh, engagement uh, with the university around the use uh, of public money uh, towards uh, how we can actually achieve our mutual uh, objectives. And uh, just to give an indication of that, uh, I recently wrote uh, to the vice chancellors over the course of the summer just to, just to again, emphasise the priorities that uh, this executive and, and assembly have and expect of the higher education sector and uh, indeed the, the universities have acknowledged that and are working towards uh, those, those plans. So I, I believe that we, ha we have strength. I, I urge the member not to put too much stock again in one individual uh, league table because there are a range of different measurements out there uh, that people are purporting uh, as a means of ranking universities which always, don't always stack up in terms of reality. Thank you and I call Ms Katrina Ruan. Gordon Margaret, uh, Prince, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I wonder, could the Minister give me an indication of whether the recent changes to the educational maintenance, allow maintenance allowance um, have had an impact on the number of young people staying on in further education post-16? Well, I, I, would, I would say to the member, and thank her for, for her question, that um, obviously the changes to EMA were something that were jointly agreed um, between my department and the Department of Education, and then endorsed uh, by, by the executive. Uh, what they are seeking to do is to better target the available resources at helping those uh, uh, individuals from the, the lowest income households uh, to, to remain uh, in education. Uh, we have a very strong track record uh, in Northern Ireland uh, of young people staying on uh, in education, which is better than in other parts of these islands, something we can uh, be proud of. And if anything, the evidence uh, of, of recent years has been that that uh, trend has been consolidated and more young people are uh, staying on. And we see that, for example, in terms of the number of applications uh, that are going in to sit, whether it's GCSEs uh, or, or A-levels. So obviously this is the first year of the changes, and we, we will see what the actual impact on the ground is. But we were clear that there would be a reduction of the number of young people receiving EMA, but in exchange we are concentrating the resource where it will make the biggest difference. Uh, and given that there was a dead weight uh, in the situation previously, um, we have sought to, to address that while preserving the core of the scheme. Ms. Katrina Ryan for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer and I wonder could he tell uh, me whether he's satisfied with the level of financial uh, advice available for students aged 16 to 19 um, at our post-primary and higher education institutions. 
Uh, well, I think the member is right to, to identify this as being an issue that I think we need to be uh, conscious of. It's, it's more than simply uh, an issue for those uh, young people in terms of how they engage uh, with either secondary education or further or higher education. I think we do need to, to encourage our young people in terms of the best use uh, of, of resources. Um, Equally, there's an issue in terms of ensuring that uh, everyone is fully avail aware of the uh, support that is available to them and can access uh, those. And again, our various in institutions will work with young people to give them that advice, and we're always happy to learn lessons as to how that can be done better. Mr. Dahi Mackay. Mr. Maggot, a previous concur. The, uh, the Minister will be aware uh, from recent media articles. Uh, as some of the issues uh, and problems in terms of cross-border student mobility. And of course, this is an educational impact uh, and this is an economic impact. Uh, can I ask the Minister what he is doing to tackle this problem? Again, I thank the member for his interest in this. And it's fair to say that the, the level of student flows on the island of Ireland, whether we're talking uh, north-south or south to north, is below its potential uh, and is currently at a level um, below what has been the more recent historical trend as well. So there's certainly uh, scope uh, for, for, for uh, improvement in that regard. Um, the officials of my department are working with our counterparts in the Department for Education and Skills in the Republic of Ireland uh, to address these issues. The member will also be aware that uh, CBI and IBEC um, published a significant report in this matter in 2011 with I think it's either 10 or 12 recommendations, a number of which are directly relevant uh, to my department and others uh, to the institutions. We're working through th those issues. One of the, the key issues is the recognition uh, of the A-star, um, and I know his colleague, the Minister of Education, uh, is leading uh, on, on that particular issue. Then there's issues in terms of career advice, making sure that young people are aware of the, op of the options that are available uh, to them in the, the different uh, jurisdictions. And we've also recently uh, improved the financial uh, support uh, for students, particularly from Northern Ireland, who wish to study uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and while we have moved to replace the, the payment of the registration fee, with a tuition uh, fee loan uh, to cover that. We have a much more generous uh, bait and support allowance, which actually allows young people to actually survive uh, while they're doing uh, their degree course. So the changes are in place. What we need, now need to do is to particularly encourage uh, young people to, to consider all of the options available to them. And uh, we're not there to advocate particular courses of action, uh, but to ensure that there's a level playing field and people have the full information available. Mr. Mackay for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, if he has discussed the matter uh, with his counterpart, the Days Minister, Rory Quinn, uh, in the Dublin Government, uh, and what his views are uh, on the matter? Um, I have discussed the matter on a number of occasions with my uh, counterpart, uh, Rory Quinn. I also know John O'Dowd has had uh, similar uh, discussions. Um, I also appeared um, in the past number of months before the um, Good Friday Agreement uh, Committee in the Arctis, um, where we had a very healthy exchange around uh, higher education issues, uh, which also touched upon um, some aspects of, of research. Um, I think uh, it's also worth highlighting, given that the members give me this opportunity, that there's also potential to significantly improve the degree of collaboration on a north-south basis with respect to research within the higher education and also further education uh, settings. And in particular, as we look to maximise the amount of drawdown of competitive European Union funds, that type of collaboration is actually key uh, to really making the most of, of the available opportunities. Thank you. And I call Mr Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that the number of students registered blind or with a serious visual impairment uncorrected by glasses fell from 360 in 2007-2008 to only 85 in 2011-12, and the number of students registered deaf or a serious hearing impairment fell from 250 to 100 over the same period. What action has he taken to address this? Again, I thank the member uh, for, for his question, and um, we, we are aware uh, of, the, of those figures. I, I would stress and really emphasise to the member and to the House uh, that both the further education system and the higher education system are open uh, to people irrespective of any uh, disability uh, or impairment uh, that may, they may have, whether that is a, um, a, a, a sight issue, a hearing issue, or indeed a learning disability um, issue. 
And just to highlight one particular intervention we have made uh, in recent weeks, uh, the additional support fund um, which is available within the further education system uh, to provide support uh, to, to young people who, who do need assistance, uh, that has seen its budget increase by about 33%. Uh, from uh, 1.5 million to uh, 2 million. So hopefully that will begin uh, to make a difference there. Uh, but ultimately this is about uh, encouraging people to apply uh, to uh, further education and to understand that the, the assistance is available for them and there's no reason uh, that, that they should be discouraged in any way uh, from developing their own potential to its maximum. Mr Ross Hussey for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. The extra £500,000 funding within the Additional Support Fund is indeed most welcome for potential students who have a disability. However, does the Minister believe that the allocation of funding before an audit is carried out to establish gaps in disability provision within further education is the best way forward? Again, I thank the member for supplementary. He's touching on, on, on a wider issue, um, and he will be aware we've had a number of discussions in the, the, this chamber on this issue, and also within the committee. And indeed, the committee um, are planning to do an inquiry in terms of the issue of uh, post-19 special educational needs. Um, we, we, in, in response to a number of representations I have received, we have conducted an audit of the availability of courses across the FE uh, sector to see where there are gaps so we can actually challenge those. Now, obviously, resources are uh, fixed, um, and while we can maybe add in some additional resources, there is a, a limit to, in terms of how far we can extend uh, provision. But I do want to see that we have, as far as, as possible, a, a uniformity of, provi of provision uh, across uh, Northern Ireland. And the audit that we have now uh, completed and uh, will hopefully uh, pass on to, to the committee uh, in the very near future uh, will enable us to proceed with that work. Um, we are looking closely at this issue over the, over the next uh, number of months. We are looking in particular at what happens in terms of disability employment uh, to ensure uh, that we have the support available. So there's a review of the disability employment service uh, offer. There's also then the wider issue in terms of what we do uh, with young people, which cuts across departments. And I'm happy uh, to lead uh, on my own aspects and also those aspects that interface with other departments. And I, I've no doubt my colleagues and executive feel likewise. Thank you. And as Mr. Uh, Paul Given is not in this place, I move on to call Mr. Uh, Samuel Gardner. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that the fact that there are no crash facilities at the University of Ulster in McGee will limit study options for parents? Well, I thank, again, thank the member for his question and certainly understand um, the concern that he has expressed and that's been shared uh, by a, a large number uh, of, of other um, MLAs. But I do need to stress um, to the members in the House, this is a matter uh, for the, the University of Ulster uh, to, to take forward. While this uh, department funds the universities to a large extent and sets the high-level policy direction, um, they are autonomous bodies. They're not, even, they're not NDPBs as such, um, or arm's length bodies. They are autonomous uh, from um, the, the department. It is for them to set their own, their own policies. Now, my understanding is that there was limited demand uh, for th those facilities, and that can be met uh, through, through other means. But it is something that no doubt members will wish, wish to keep under review and to push the, the university under as well. The other aspect that we will be concerned about is uh, in relation to any funds that have been uh, allocated, whether recently or in the past, uh, and if there's uh, appropriate, we will seek to claw those back uh, if they're no longer being used for the purpose originally allocated. Mr Samuel Gardner for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy St Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his response to my question. But further, could I ask how the Minister is working alongside the Office of the First uh, and Deputy First Minister ensure that the child care strategy takes account of parents who are studying in further or higher education. Again, I thank the member for his question. Again, it touches on a much uh, wider issue relating to, to childcare. He rightly identifies that it is OFM, DFM who take the lead on a childcare strategy, and, and I understand that they're at a very advanced uh, stage uh, in, in, in that process. Um, my department is very keen to work and collaborate with them um, in relation to that. And in particular, we have a distinct role in terms of ensuring that we're upskilling uh, the workforce in that regard. Um, I would also highlight that we have a commitment to widening participation 
uh, in terms of both further education and higher education. And that does include ensuring that people from a range of backgrounds can, can access um, the, the course of choices, the, the, sort of the choices of, of course uh, that, that, that uh, are, are available. And childcare is obviously a dimension to that. Thank you. And uh, that ends the period for topical questions. So we will now move on to those oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one, please. Uh, there are currently 337 individuals on the Apprenticeship NI programme in the North Down Local Government District, ranking North Down ninth by apprenticeship num numbers of the, of the 26 local government areas. I would encourage all businesses in Northern Ireland to consider employing a young person and then having them participate on the Apprenticeships NI programme. An apprenticeship provides a unique combination of work on and off the job training, all relevant to business needs. It is a cost-effective way for business to grow a loyal and productive workforce supported by my department through funding the off-the-job training through a network of training providers, including the six further education colleges. It is the business which creates the employment required for an apprenticeship and to raise the awareness of Apprenticeships NI with business. My department has conducted an advertising campaign earlier this year, including a burst again in July ahead of the main recruitment period. This campaign focuses on the benefits gained by an employing an apprentice. In Northern Ireland, there are almost 9,000 apprentices on the programme. This represents about 11 apprentices per 1,000 workers. This is well below other developed economies in Europe, such as Switzerland, who have four times the equivalent number of apprentices in their workforce. This is one of the reasons why I have launched the major review of our policies on apprenticeships and youth training in February this year. And key aspects of the review include how to encourage SMEs to engage with apprenticeships, how to expand apprenticeships into other sectors, such as the professions, and the role of higher apprenticeships. The outworkings of the review, which will report through a series of high-level strategic statements in the autumn, is expected to result in future policy proposals, which will culminate in more businesses offering apprenticeship opportunities across Northern Ireland, including North Down. Mr. Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister recognise the value of apprenticeships for developing skills and knowledge in young people? And it, does he recognise it as a creditable alternative to going to university? Uh, absolutely, and I, I would dare say we could use the member to help us to sell um, the, this model of, of training. Um, it is important to recognise that uh, apprenticeships um, at times can be a, a very efficient way of, of, of training because there's a much closer match between supply and demand. They're very good for um, companies in that they will secure workers who are trained in the very particular needs of that business. But also young people will know that they actually have the skills which are bankable and in a very competitive uh, job market. So they have a better chance of holding down and uh, sustaining a job. The members also right to highlight the, the opportunity of higher level apprenticeships. And we do need to get away from this notion that there's some sort of hierarchy that an apprenticeship is something you do if you don't do so well in your A-levels or can't get into university. It's some sort of secondary option. We have to have a parity of esteem, if we can use that phrase, between uh, apprenticeships and higher education. And people will make informed choices based upon good careers advice in terms of what best suits their particular um, area. And it's interesting to note that we, we have some companies that are now offering parallel routes uh, which reach more or less the same destination. In some, they will take people at A-levels and train them up. In others, they will actually take graduates and do a little bit of training. Both are essentially reaching this, the same point. So we're, there's a lot of interesting experiments going on out there. Uh, but absolutely, we're, we're very keen to reinforce that apprenticeships in particular, as we move into higher level apprenticeships, are a plausible alternative to, tr to traditional higher education. But with the same token, we don't rule out apprentices and actually will be encouraging them to actually seek to get a higher level qualification themselves as part of their training. Thank you, and I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his response so far. Minister, according to Dell's statistical bulletin on apprenticeships in Northern Ireland, the number of apprenticeships in Northern Ireland starts appears to have fallen between the, the years 2010, 11, and 2012. Um, would, would you agree, Minister, that if you're serious about apprenticeships, you really have to address this decline? Well, I mean, I thank the member for, for pointing that, that out. And, um, the fact is that we do not have enough apprenticeships offered in, in Northern Ireland. That is an absolute fact, and that is the, one of the, the main reasons why we have launched this, this major uh, review. Now, I, I would dare suggest that the, the very particular figures that he suggests are perhaps a product of the, the, 
the economic cycle at that time, um, and we were in, in some of the more difficult uh, times in terms of the current uh, economic uh, downturn. I would stress that an apprenticeship is a job, and it is dependent upon employers coming forward and offering uh, places. One of the things that we will be seeking to do uh, with the review is to make it easier for employers to, to hire uh, apprentices, and in particular um, SMEs, and the member will know we have a, pre a predominance of, of SMEs within our economy, are at times nervous about the perceived risks of taking on an apprentice. So we want to see what type of models we can put in place, whether it's some sort of financial incentive or whether it's some means by which we can spread and manage the risk uh, that will enable more and more SMEs to engage with that type of training, which should, will be beneficial to their company. I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for he, his answer, and I think the whole House would applaud him in any efforts to break down the, the uh, difference between uh, academic and vocational education. If I'm right, I picked the Minister up as saying that four times more apprentices exist in Switzerland. Uh, bearing in mind the high unemployment among the 16 to 25 year olds, has the Minister got sufficient funds to offer people uh, places on apprenticeships? And if not, is it his intention to make a bid in the uh, October monitoring round? Again, I thank the member for his questions and the comments he has made in terms of, of the context. First of all, it is worth noting that um, those countries in Europe that have the strongest footprint in terms of vocational apprenticeship training, such as the Germanic countries, also have the lowest levels of unemployment, including uh, youth unemployment, and I'm sure that's no uh, coincidence. So there are lessons there to be learnt, uh, and it, it does really stray into this notion of a much more efficient means of matching supply and demand within the economy. The member is also right to, to stress the need for additional resources as we uh, uh, move to further expand our apprenticeship offering. Um, and that the pressure will come in two different areas. I mean, first of all, if we move to more higher level apprenticeships, they may well be more expensive uh, in terms of training than the current um, offer. And secondly, we may see an increased demand in the number of apprenticeships uh, to, be, to be funded. Um, I think one particular source of, of funding in this regard is the European Social Fund. And we're currently consulting on the new programme uh, for 2014 onwards. And within that, we, we have uh, sought to highlight uh, the potential for increased funding uh, of apprenticeships. Uh, there may well be circumstances where we need to look for more, whether it's from reallocations within my own department or elsewhere within the block grant. Uh, and we will keep that under review. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his update and the work he's doing in relation to apprenticeships. Can I ask the Minister what uh, creative modes of delivery he's exploring to improve the apprenticeship offering, such as consortium delivery, for example? Well, again, I thank the Member uh, for his question. This really goes to the point I was making earlier on about um, how we can better encourage SMEs uh, to engage in, in this process. And to, to to be realistic, at the start, I mean, we're not going to have a situation where every single company in Northern Ireland is offering uh, apprenticeships. And as we go back to Mr. Dallet's point, I mean, even in Switzerland, you would see a situation where maybe only about 30% of companies uh, would offer an apprenticeship, and th th there will be a skewing towards uh, bigger companies. But there, there would be nonetheless a bigger particip a participation from small and medium-sized enterprises than we would have l locally in Northern Ireland. Part of the difficulty is that companies maybe see taking on an additional pair of hands and paying the wage as being too much uh, of, of a risk. They may see uh, or be concerned about a distraction in terms of, in terms of training or, or, or be uncertain as to what they can offer um, whenever the apprenticeship uh, finishes. So there are a number of different models uh, that are available for us to look at in terms of how we can actually spread the risk and manage that. And one of which could be that we have a, an interim um, body that actually is the employing agency uh, for the, the apprentice rather than the company uh, directly. Those are all issues that are under consideration at present and we still have to make a final judgment as to what is most suitable for Northern Ireland. Thank you. And can I inform the, uh, the House that question five has been withdrawn and will receive a written answer? And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, could I uh, ask the Minister question two, please? Um, thank the Member for his question. ICT is a priority sector for my department. In June 2012, I published an action plan to address the specific skill issues within the sector. 
This plan, agreed by the ICT Working Group, which includes representation from employers, colleges, universities and other, other government departments, is a living document and continues to be adapted to meet the changing needs of employers. While progress has been significant and has coincided with an increase in applications to IT-related degrees at our local universities of over 24 per cent, new initiatives continue to be, to be taken forward. In the past month, I have announced new pilot academies in data analytics and cloud technology which will offer training and work placement opportunities to 34 participants. A second cohort of the successful public-private ICT apprenticeship scheme is in motion, with around 50 places available, and a further cohort of over 100 students have enrolled on MSc courses for non-IT graduates in our local universities. Further, furthermore, this month, a new software and systems development A-level has been introduced in Northern Ireland. These developments build on the high, high level of existing activity being delivered as part of the ICT Action Plan. This includes a third cohort of 32 participants on the Software Testers Academy who commenced training uh, uh, this month and a higher level of apprenticeship in ICT which has been piloted at South West College and also the wider uh, review of apprenticeships which will be of direct relevance to the ICT sector. Mr McCarthy for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I do thank the Minister for his very uh, positive response. I'm sure the Assembly will uh, welcome the recent, recent initiatives taken by the Minister. But we can't rest on our laurels. Can I ask or inquire of the Minister what the next steps will be to make, progress, make further progress on this issue? Again, I thank the member for his comments and, and question, and maybe just highlight a, a number of points. I mean, first of all, to highlight that we have launched a number of pilot academies, uh, I have no doubt that these will be uh, very successful, and they are in, in cutting-edge areas such as data analytics and cloud uh, technology. We will want to mainstream these in due course, indeed to expand them uh, where, where appropriate. We have also touched upon the review of apprenticeships, and I think that uh, offers new opportunities uh, on a much bigger scale uh, for the ICT sector. We can also look to the forthcoming uh, review of careers because, in many ways, careers is the foundation stone on which much of our economy is built. And we do need to see what more we can do in terms of encouraging young people uh, to consider careers in this flourishing sector uh, within Northern Ireland. And finally, the member will note that we have uh, a very significant increase in the number of applications uh, to uh, universities, which we welcome. But there comes a point where physical capacity issues and also the staffing issues come, come into play. So we are in discussions with the universities to see what more we can do uh, to take uh, their offerings on to the next level. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell. Uh, the Minister outlined the availability of ICT schemes and uh, uh, courses. Uh, but does he accept that in some hard-to-reach communities it is more than just making these classes and courses available? It's really about proactively seeking out people who will need to try and get qualifications to, to make themselves available in the job market. And what is he doing to try and promote that? Again, I thank the member for his question, and he, I mean, he does raise, raise an issue that we do need to maximise participation. We need to be finding people uh, to go into ICT careers, and whether we're talking about trying to address the, the gender balance, or whether we're trying to encourage people who maybe haven't thought about this career, or indeed facing particular barriers, um, we, we have to address those. Um, there is a lot of good work that happens uh, with uh, communities in this regard. Obviously, whenever we talk about essential skills, it's not just literacy and numeracy, it's also ICT. Um, this month, we are now mainstreaming LEAP uh, across uh, Northern Ireland, uh, and that is a community-based uh, project which will engage with people. Also, in terms of the, the NEATS uh, strategy, Pathways to Success, uh, and under the, the Collaboration and, and Innovation Fund, a number of the projects that are seeking to engage with vulnerable young people who are, or, or those who are facing barriers um, are based around uh, ICT. So there's a, a focus there in terms of trying to, to touch the, the, the communities that Mr Campbell has identified. I call Mr Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he's confident that there are enough uh, places being offered in the North West region uh, to try and meet the demand and to try and attract all the jobs that we want to attract in the, this, uh, t this sector? Uh, 
I think that the straight answer to, to the member is that I think that, that, that more can be done, particularly in, in the northwest uh, in, in this area. And obviously, later on um, this evening, we'll be having a discussion around um, McGee uh, and the potential uh, with the university. But I think as well, that I would encourage um, much more attention to be given as well around the intermediate level skills, the technical skills, uh, where there is particular demand uh, being voiced uh, by, by employers, in, including in, in the ICT sector. The member will also note that in support of the, the One Plans that Skills Directorate, uh, we have recently appointed a, a member of my staff to, to act as a liaison officer uh, in, in that regard, and that is there to provide a much more focused uh, attention uh, around skills in the North West. Call Ms Sandra Overland. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for his responses. Um, he made reference to the ICT Action Plan that was uh, launched in June 2012. Um, can the Minister possibly outline the alterations that he's made to that action plan since that time, considering the economic climate since then? Uh, again, I thank the member for her question. She rightly identifies that this was never meant to be something that uh, either sat on a shelf um, or was fixed, was fixed in stone. Um, we have uh, periodic reviews uh, of the action plan where we bring the stakeholders together. And as and when we come across either the need for new initiatives or whether new initiatives are happening, we will update the plan uh, accordingly. And just to give a few examples uh, to, to the member, um, we're obviously down in a new context where we, we have the A-level in place. So the um, attention now shifts towards encouraging schools uh, to actually offer that A-level. Uh, and at present, we only have a handful of schools that are making that choice available uh, to young people. Uh, we've also now um, developed um, a much greater focus around cer certain specialities, and we've mentioned uh, data analytics and cloud technology. And that really does illustrate that this is a fast-moving uh, industry, and new types of, of, of expertise can be required at relatively short notice. So it's important that we continue to have the flexibility uh, to respond to the needs of whether it's uh, investors from overseas or local and indigenous companies. So again, those type of issues would be reflected in, in, in the action plan as we, we, we update it on a regular basis. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, um, I will, will group uh, questions three and 11. Members are aware of my previous statements to the Assembly and my plans to review the teacher training infrastructure in Northern Ireland and to bring forward options for further consideration. Yesterday, I announced that I have appointed Dr. Passy Salberg uh, to chair an expert panel of international standing in the field of higher education with the professional expertise to meet the objectives of the review. Dr. Salberg is currently Director General of the National Centre for International Mobility and Cooperation in the Ministry of Education and Culture within the Finnish Government. He has a long track record in education and development and has been an active figure in promoting educational changes in Finland and beyond. He brings high-level strategic expertise and advice to this review. Dr. Salberg will be supported by four other panel members and I will make a further announcement about the other members in due course. I placed a copy of yesterday's press release in the Assembly Library. The panel will have the scope to develop their own methodology for taking the, the initiative forward, which I envisage will include engagement with representatives of the five teacher training providers. The final output from this assignment will be a report setting out the options for the, for the future shape of initial teacher training in Northern Ireland. This will then allow my officials and myself to enter into further dialogue with the various institutions with the intention of finding an agreed way forward. Call Alistair Macdonald for a supplementary. Could I thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Minister for his answer? But could I ask him if the, if the Department has made any projections or if there are any indications uh, to the Department of possible adverse impacts of the study in terms of future needs? And other, uh, you know, will future needs in any way be threatened by the, the, the line that the Department is pursuing? Uh, I thank the member for his supplementary. I can assure him that there is no danger of that uh, in, any, in any shape or, or, or form. Um, obviously, the teacher demand model is something that the Department of Education um, controls, and they will set the numbers required uh, for uh, the training of, of teachers. My concerns are largely with the, the nature of the infrastructure uh, it, itself. And the fact is we have a multiplicity of providers within the context of 1.8 million people. 
And that's very much against the, the trends that are happening in other jurisdictions, hence the need uh, for an international perspective uh, on what we do. Um, we have looked at the future financial projections uh, around, in particular, the, the teacher training colleges, uh, and it is clear that they are not sustainable uh, going, going forward. Even if we do nothing, uh, they are not going to be sus uh, sustainable. Uh, but in the event that other policy priorities uh, change, um, that situation could come to, to a head even sooner. So the only responsible thing to do is to take forward uh, th this review. But we will always ensure that we are training teachers uh, to meet the, the, lo the local market. And if anything at present, that there is a surplus of, of trained teachers uh, and good efforts are being made to put them uh, to good use in terms of literacy and numeracy in some respects. Uh, but it's still a, a, sur a surplus and um, we want to ensure we are investing in the right needs of our economy. Mr Michael Majimsi for a supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker uh, and I of course am keen to know where we are as far as the status of Stramilis is concerned and I understand that uh, before the summer we were, you were appointing uh, an expert to advise you. Now I hear the experts, the chairman, but there is going to be a panel. The panel is still not appointed but will be appointed in due course and then going into a long discussion. But when I hear words like not sustainable and I hear this long process, you will understand how anxious we are to find out exactly what your proposals are as far as Strand Millis College is concerned. Well, um, again, I thank the member for, for his question. And um, we are taking a deliberative, uh, evidence based approach uh, to this. Um, it is my intention to point the rest of the panel within a matter uh, of, of weeks. We simply have to um, confirm uh, the participation uh, with the panel before we proceed to announcing names. So we just have to have a degree of caution uh, in, in that regard. It's the intention that they will be reporting um, in the spring of, of 2014 uh, around this issue. Um, I don't think we're Taking, the, taking this slowly, and if anything, the mood of this assembly, um, particularly around the issue of the, the, the potential merger of Strand Minnes and Queen's University, was against that. So this was, was placed on the table um, by the by, by predecessor as minister, uh, the colleague of Mr. Jimsey, um, uh, but it was very quickly apparent that there was not the appetite uh, for simply addressing the future of Strand Minnes um, simply through the lens of a potential merger of Queens, hence uh, the need for a much wider uh, review of the, of the infrastructure so we can explore all of the issues that, that are out there and they include some of the equality issues as well that have been uh, 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 raised by members of uh, matters of concern. Call Mr Pat Sheehan. I'd uh, like to thank the Minister for his answers uh, so far. Uh, and uh, could I ask the Minister, does he intend moving forward on the basis of agreement with the institutions in question? Or if no agreement can be reached, does he intend imposing change? Well, I can understand why the member, member is asking that question, but I think it's probably a, a premature uh, issue uh, to, to, to be raising. My preference would obviously be to work on the basis of consensus uh, with the, the, the various in institutions. Obviously, we do respect them, uh, and they all have long and proud um, histories. I think what is important is that um, all of the institutions engage with the review, but they also recognise that the status quo in terms of the system is simply not sustainable. So change is inevitable and it is better that we address change on the basis of, of consensus and I believe this process will allow that opportunity. Um, but if people aren't prepared to engage with that then we will have to, to see what happens. Uh, and even if we sit back and do nothing uh, on that, um, the situation will change adversely uh, in, in, in terms of the, the future interests of the, of the, the various stakeholders. I call Mr Sammy Wilson. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, whilst I understand the importance of the institutions and the various institutions involved in teacher training, does the Minister not also accept that there is an imperative not to keep on training teachers for unemployment and enticing young people into teacher training courses only to find that there is no job for them at the end of it? And if this review is to be effective, does he accept that the the, the total number of teachers required is also an important factor in making any decisions. 
Uh, again, I thank the, the member for his, his, uh, his question, and I look forward to being grilled uh, from him from the back benches over the, the, the months to come. And uh, I suspect he's had a major advantage uh, over most other members in terms of knowing the ins and outs of uh, a lot of the financial arrangements of the, the various departments, so no doubt he will be forensic in his analysis uh, of, of these uh, ver various uh, issues. What I would say is that um, having a, a more shared and integrated system for uh, teacher training would be much more sustainable and would have a much higher level of tolerance for shifts in terms of the number of teachers that are being trained in Northern Ireland. And at present, um, there can be a sense that the numbers that are being trained uh, are as much a reflection of the need to keep institutions uh, sustainable as the needs of the economy as we move forward. And to maybe put this into very sharp focus, at present, uh, we are spending more money to train a teacher in Northern Ireland, of which we are going to be training too many and uh, we are spending less on training an engineer, where arguably we need more engineers in terms of the future of our, of our growth. So that puts, puts that in very sharp focus, perhaps. Call Mr Jim Mallister. The Minister, no doubt, will say that the panel appointed is to look at infrastructure, but nothing is freestanding in education. Uh, and isn't it the case that his choice of chair, uh, Dr Schauberg, uh, is, he is a person clearly from his writings, who is an avowed opponent of selection, an avowed opponent of any form of standardised testing, and an avowed opponent even of parental choice in education. Is there an agenda here that the Minister is following with the Education Minister? Um, I'm happy to give the member a absolute categorical assurance uh, that um, all of those issues that he ha has outlined um, are not part of the terms of reference uh, for uh, the, the, the stage two of the review, either officially, unofficially, or in any other way, and that there is certainly no conspiracy afoot in terms of this being a Trojan horse in terms of any of those other issues. Those are all issues that uh, the House is, is well familiar with, and uh, th there will be separate processes uh, for discussing those and agreeing any changes, if any, um, uh, in, in, in that respect. But in terms of what the member is concerned about, he has nothing to fear whatsoever. Thank you, and I call Ms Bronwyn McGahan. Gurami, a good question for in the main, discussions between my department and private sector representatives to improve the provision and success of apprenticeship schemes have been, have been, have been within the context of the review for apprenticeships that I announced in February 2013. However, discussions have not focused solely on private sector representatives. I have instructed Dell officials to engage with a wide range of stakeholders, including young people, the voluntary and community sector, sector skills representatives and training providers. I have established an expert panel which includes employers and education and skill providers to advise on the work of the review, which has now met three times regarding apprenticeships and once focusing on youth training. Alongside this, my officials have met with individual businesses and sector skills councils and worked with partners including the CBI and the Federation of Small Businesses to engage directly with that sector. I have recently facilitated a series of stakeholder forums for employers, learners and providers and these have provided an opportunity for key stakeholders to help shape the review. Also, a call for submissions was launched uh, on the 4th of September in relation to the review of apprenticeships, and there will also be a similar uh, review call in terms of for submissions in relation to youth training. I call Bronwyn McGahan for a supplementary. Gurami Ogut, I, I thank the Minister for his response. It is my understanding that uh, electrical training trust students are currently unable to enrol in regional colleges to pursue apprenticeships, and this is having an impact on their potential careers. So, is the Minister planning to factor this into his review of apprenticeships? Mm. Member for her supplementary, and she touches upon um, one aspect um, of a much more multifaceted problem, which a number of MLAs have been in touch with me um, in, in recent months to, to highlight. Um, at times, the, the rules around uh, the current model of apprenticeships uh, can be uh, somewhat stifling, and sometimes they may be perceived as being slightly illogical as well, and maybe frustrate people's opportunities and, uh, and their chances uh, for uh, progression. I would assure the member that, in terms of the current re uh, review, every single aspect of apprenticeship policy 
is on the table. And while we, we, at times we talk about the broad sweep in terms of the headline changes we, we want to make, we also want to look at the, the, the very particular rules uh, around apprenticeships, which have caused uh, some frustration, um, not only for members, but indeed for, for young people across Northern Ireland. I call Mr Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that given the uh, very high number of uh, people that are unemployed in this uh, potential apprenticeship group, that there is uh, virtually a social responsibility on uh, many of our medium to large companies, and particularly those ones who are in receipt of, uh, in many cases, large amounts of financial support from Dell to actually ha take up that social responsibility and provide an opportunity for training places? I, um, I fully agree with what the member is, is, is saying. Um, I mean, to give a very specific example, uh, in terms of public procurement contracts now, there's much greater use of social clauses, which include um, uh, aspects in terms of engagement with, with apprenticeships. The broader point stands that um, companies do have a, a duty to invest in the future of the economy as a whole, and that includes uh, investing in, in young people. Sometimes you will see some companies overtraining in the sense that they, they have an expectation that they may not hire everybody in due course, uh, but they will be available for the rest of the sector or indeed uh, their, their supply chain. But I wouldn't w wish employers to simply see this in terms of a social responsibility. Hiring an apprentice actually adds to the bottom line of a business. And depending upon the particular complexity of the, the, the trading needs, uh, an employer may well break even in terms of productivity after a year. In a more complex area, it may be, it may be two years. But a, an employer will get a productivity gain directly from employing an apprentice. So they can do it for a sense of corporate res social responsibility, but they can also do it in terms of what is in their own direct interest economically. Thank you. And 